Good evening and a warm welcome on behalf of Milim to this evening's presentation. Our online series of talks and conversations continues with our guest, the author Wendy Lauer, and I'll introduce Wendy in just a moment. This evening we have an international audience and an international speaker too, so welcome to you wherever you are in the UK and indeed wherever you are in the world. Please do ask questions, you can do this at any time you like by using the Q&A facility on your screen and typing in whatever it is you'd like to ask. And as always, we'll try our best to get through as many of your questions as we can. Please also be aware of the chat facility. This allows you to send a message to the other participants on this webinar, should you wish to do so. Finally, this event is being recorded and will be posted at the Millim website, millim.org.uk in the near future. Recordings of our prior events are on the website, as well as details about our packed calendar of future events, uh, and you can book tickets for those events online if you wish. And so to our speaker. Wendy Lauer is the author of several books, including the National Book Award and National Jewish Book Award finalist Hitler's Furies, which has been translated into 23 languages. She is the John K. Roth Professor of History and Director of the Magrublian Center for Human Rights at Claremont McKenna College in California. Until recently, she was Acting Director for the Mandel Center for the Advanced Holocaust Studies in the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. This evening, Wendy is speaking about her recently published book, The Ravine, A Family, A Photograph, A Holocaust Massacre, Revealed, Wendy joins us this evening from a cabin at Yosemite mm -hmm. National Park in California. Wendy, we're delighted to have you with us. Uh, so without further ado, over to you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with all of you this evening. I appreciate you taking the time to attend this webinar, um, to learn more about my work and about the book that I just published, The Ravine. Um, yes, I'm, I'm actually Zooming from a really a, a slice of of paradise here on earth um, and uh, was canoeing this morning. It's, it's noon here. Um, so I also have the day ahead of me and I might even get in some trout fishing. So um, I hope you're all spending some time this summer with friends and family and are all safe um, in, this, in this situation we find ourselves in, in this COVID world. Um, the book that I recently published that we're gonna look at today, um, the center of the, of the analysis of the history is a very disturbing photograph. So I, I saw that there was a disclaimer that was put up on the screen, but I, I do want to stress that um, it's an atrocity photograph and um, showing a family being murdered during the Holocaust. Uh, I think it's very important to study these photographs and I hope you'll agree with me at the end of the talk. That's basically my argument. Um, but I do want to, I did want to give you some little, a little bit of a warning um, and I will not dwell too much on it, but um, on the history of it as much as possible. Um, so thank you very much for your, your interest. Now we've, we've all seen how one photograph of suffering or violence can move audiences and propel humanitarian action and social justice. So think about all the iconic images of atrocities. As an American, I think of the naked girl fleeing the napalm attack in Vietnam, or more recently, in Europe, the little Syrian boy, Alan Kurdi, whose corpse washed up on the Turkish beach um, in Bodrum and, and how that changed uh, European refugee policy, specifically in, mostly in Germany. We also can think of when we recall the Holocaust, when I talk to my students and I ask them, tell me what you know about the Holocaust, they um, speak to it in images. They can't explain what's going on in the photograph, but there are certain images that have come, become part of our collective memory. Um, they're widely circulated. They're displayed often with little information about the circumstances of the person's picture, pic, person's pictured in them, or even less about the photographer. Let's look at some of them together. I um, would like to share my screen. Um, I have this going to, I hope you can all see this. I'm gonna share. Here we go, sorry. 
These are some of the images from the Holocaust that students often refer to, or some of you may think be thinking about the entrances to the Birkenau camp. This is this there, as far as photos that show the murder of Jews. Um, there are a few that that appear in a lot of the exhibitions around the world at Yad Vashem, um, at the Museum in Washington, for instance. This man in Vinnytsia, Ukraine. Uh, the back of the photo had a caption, the last man and Jewish man, last Jew, it said in, in Vinitsa. Here's an image, these liberation photos of, of corpses and bones and Bergen-Belsen and Buchenwald and Eli Wiesel peering out from the bunk at Buchenwald. The little boy with his hands up from the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising of April 43. This is from a perpetrator, Nazi perpetrator's photo album, Jürgen Stroop, the Waffen-SS commander who presented this with pride, you know, uh, to his superiors, to Heinrich Himmler, as, an, as a document to what they did to the Jews of Poland, of Warsaw. And here, of course, we have an image of Anne Frank, um, uh, probably one of the more um, uh, recognizable victims of the Holocaust uh, worldwide. So these are the kinds of standard illustrations that are not usually studied as historical documents. Um, and many of these graphic images have been the su subject of scholarly debates about what should or should not be displayed. What are the rules about what should be studied and how it should be researched? What, were the, what are the ethics and methods of that kind of inquiry? I had written books that privileged the use of Nazi documentation and then another book about a single victim's diary. But I started to think about visual evidence in a single photograph and how it might open up new lines of inquiry and discovery about the Holocaust. I also was thinking about all the strides, having worked at the museum in Washington and run the research institute there and been part of the world of museology, all the ways that in public education, we tell stories and we present stories using artifacts and images and film clips and documents and posters, um, all these different types of sources that are available to us, um, especially on the Holocaust. Um, and what are some of the um, missing pieces in that history? Uh, I've worked a lot on Ukraine. I started my work there in the summer of 92. Um, every fourth victim of the Holocaust died in what is the terrain of, of Ukraine, um, the so-called Holocaust by bullets, the, the mass shootings that occurred outside the camp system. And most of those Jews, about well, about 50%, but most of the children in particular have not been identified. They are among the, the missing missing, those communities, those families that were so totally wiped out um, with, with little trace of that, no documentation, they weren't deported, they weren't registered on lists. Um, how do we uncover those stories and those lost communities? What sources are available to us um, when there are so, though, there are so few um, official records? And um, given all of this, um, uh, as far as my interest and background and what I was observing, um, I was really struck um, in August 2009, it was some time ago when I was working in the archives of the museum in DC and I was there by chance actually I was I'd come over from Germany, I was working on Hitler's Furies and on a case against a perpetrator who was still alive. And one of my colleagues came over to me um, who knew I worked on Ukraine and said Wendy, um, someone just came in two journalists had just come in from Prague. Um, with a couple of photographs that had been taken in Ukraine in 1941. And they said, we think you would be interested in, in these photographs and maybe you can tell us more about them. And uh, this was the photograph. Uh, immediately striking, and I would encourage all of you as you kind of look at this and, and try to figure out what's happening and, and kind of you know, process what's happening. Um, it's a shocking image. Uh, I welcome any immediate feedback in the chat right now and your responses to what you are seeing. Um, but over the course of a decade of research, I came to discover more and more as I studied this in detail. And what I did for the book was I, I pulled out different elements that struck me. Um, the shoes here in the foreground, which are really iconic um, and the notion that there's absence here. There's a, a presence of absence. There is a victim, um, probably a Jewish man um, who's, who was killed before um, the family we see at the center, the women and children at the center, um, and these kinds of papers or objects that are strewn around these, these shoes. 
um, that they're positioned right here in the foreground of the image, that the image is actually very composed and very stable. We're gonna look at the full image in a minute and you'll understand, you'll see that. Um, so that the image, the vividness of the image is not taken clandestinely as far as we can tell through the buttonhole of a coat or sleeve or quickly and blurry, but a very composed image with these um, shoes in the foreground. It was taken October 13th, 1941 in the town of Miropil, Ukraine, about 130 miles west of Kiev. And when we use uh, digital technology, uh, we can scan these images now, <clears throat> zoom in and zoom out. Um, you can see very closely by the shoes, the bullet casings, the kind of litter of mass murder. And it's taken in broad daylight. The sun is coming through the, this blotchy, uh, trees, this, the, the, the trunks of the trees here coming into the aperture of the camera, capturing the light and uh, realizing that this is part of the landscape of this town, this town of Mirapol, Ukraine, where there were about uh, 960 Jews were uh, accounted for in the Holocaust, but more than that um, upon the German arrival in um, early July, 1941. Um, it was historically part of the Pale of Settlement in the heartland of what was Russian Jewry, a czarist Jewry, historically for centuries, um, that had been reduced to about um, 1,900 Jews in 1941. But see the landscape here and the soil um, and the earth and, and the fact that when the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union with their allies, um, uh, the Axis allies, the Romanians, the Hungarians, the Croatians, Spanish expeditionary forces, um, and Slovakians, Slovakian uh, reinforcements and guards, um, that they were using nature. Uh, they were using the landscape. In the end of July 41, Heinrich Himmler issued a famous order in which he expanded the killing against um, uh, Jewish women and children and was exhorting his uh, uh, underlings to drive Jewish women into the swamps of Belarus and use whatever you can on the spot to, as they called it, solve the Jewish question and, and, and um, destroy those communities. And so ravines, and that's the title of the book, are part of this history of Babi Yar's the most famous, the massacre in September 1941. Um, and this was part of the machinery of destruction. We often think of machinery as more mechanical and factory style and modern, but uh, we know from other cases of genocide how much the landscape is put, put to use. And um, in Holocaust studies and its strides uh, kind of intellectually and theoretically and interdisciplinary approaches, uh, uh, which is very exciting that we have this field of scholarship um, and that we've invested in this and committed to it and institutions are backing it. Um, environmental history is another field, another growth area, if you will. Um, and so I thought about to what extent that could be part of our um, analysis of this crime scene of the kind of forensic topography of this. And the killers. Here we have a German with his head cocked to the side. We can see his cap, his visor, and the insignia and the um, markings on his shoulder and, the, and his comrade to his left. Um, and we can zoom in and actually identify the unit. And there is ample, very good documentation on the military history side of this campaign, which we can plot, we can find the movement of these units. And so that was a possibility I was uh, excited about pursuing. Possibly these one of these killers might still be around. Possibly there could be some sort of um, redress, some sort of kind of justice, right? Because what does one do upon the discovery of such an image of, of murder? Um, could the killers be brought to justice? Could the existence of the victims be restored? Note here as well, the um, intimacy is, is kind of an odd word for this, but just the closeness of these killers. And the topic of collaboration is also a very um, interesting uh, kind of subfield now, as far as looking at the history of the Holocaust as European history as not a German only um, uh, campaign, but as I mentioned, the collaborators, the Axis forces who came in, the folks who were recruited on the spot. These are Ukrainians um, shoulder to shoulder with these Germans. They don't, they're local, they don't speak any German. They're not ethnic Germans, they are Ukrainians. Um, and maybe this man in the, 
in that cap, uh, again, you have now witnesses in broad daylight, it's outside, um, you know, is an interpreter of some sort, um, and they are participating in this most horrific act, anti-Semitic act together, even though they don't share a language, don't share the culture. Um, they just know how, what they're supposed to do here. And um, there is this kind of willingness um, uh, to, to, to carry out the murder uh, right here in this community. Um, the family at the center, the photographer, I'm gonna talk about him in a moment um, because that was probably one of the biggest discoveries of the book, but the photographer here, um, clearly skilled, a stable shot, following the rule of thirds with the family in the, in the center and the killers here to the right. Uh, there's the armband on that Ukrainian collaborators. That's a repurposed red army coat. The woman in the center with her polka dotted dress and her Mary Jane shoes and that little boy, that barefooted boy, and she's clasping his hand um, and there is smoke. This is, uh, um, for lack of a better word, this is an action shot. And you can see as if the ballistics uh, analysis here is correct, they're being shot so quickly one after the other that the multiple muzzle blasts have produced halos of smoke that are still hovering in the atmosphere. And the Ukrainian rifles, is, it is inches from the head of the woman who is obscured in the smoke and the Ukrainian is doing the firing. You can see in his, the way he's standing and the grimace, his expression on his face. The journalist who came in that day um, on August, in August 2009 had the photograph. The photograph, we had a date for it, October 13th, 1941, the name of the photographer and the location of the photograph, Mirapol, Ukraine, Mirapol, Ukraine. And here is some testimony that the photographer had given in 1958. And the photographer was questioned on numerous occasions about this photograph, this very incriminating photograph. And in this photograph or in this testimony here, he describes what happened um, that day that it, he was called or told by his commander to go check out what was happening in the forest because they heard the sound of the gunfire and they heard the screaming and the commotion that, that morning. And um, the photographer, his name is Lubomir Skrovina, uh, was the company scribe. This was a Slovakian uh, kind of security unit that was brought in as a reinforcement unit. And they were just um, settled in this town um, near the train station. This town wasn't big enough to have its own German headquarters or German Gestapo headquarters. The German um, officials were coming in from a neighboring uh, district headquarters to this town and, and left the kind of security to the Slovakians um, and the Ukrainian militia. And so this photographer had heard this commotion and he was the company scribe. So he grabbed his camera. He was a hobby photographer um, and he took a series of images. And here he is, there's a picture of him from the post-war period and um, a nice looking man. And there's his camera. This was really important. He described the model camera in that testimony, but part of the history too is this material culture. And you know what can we learn from the actual object that was used to take this camera? Um, Mr. Scovina, survived the war, you can see here. He testified after the war. He died in 2005 in Banska Bistrica. And when he died, he actually donated his camera to um, the Museum of the History of Jews in Bratislava. Um, so that's why we were able to find this camera and it's part of their collection there. And he asked specifically when he donated the camera, he asked for help to find this, the negatives from the photos that he took, because he took a series. Um, and he also, in his donation, asked that a exhibit to the Holocaust be um, uh, prepared and, and um, put on display in, in that museum in um, Bratislava. So it turns out that this young man, young man at the time of the war in his early 20s, um, would not have signed up volunteer, voluntarily for it. He was against the war. Um, he hated to wear a uniform. Um, and found himself in this horrible predicament um, behind the lines, um, having to deal with kind of the witnessing um, the Holocaust as he, his unit moved from Galicia, Western Ukraine, eastward. And that photograph that we looked at is part of a series. This camera could hold a, the film that he had that day 
could hold about seven or eight, could, he could take about seven or eight images. Um, and we found five of the seven, seven. And this is another really disturbing image. Um, this is one of the, uh, of the five. Um, and here we can see the perpetrator more clearly as far as um, the, the uniform and, and trying to identify that unit and drill down to that unit. And, and here's yet another woman being killed at that same spot now by the German. And again, the shoes and the crumpled coat. So it must've been taken um, shortly um, around the time the other photograph was taken immediately. And here it may be a, um, a Jewish armband, a star there. Uh, I'm not sure if there are a couple of different theories about what, what is actually there. But this was the photographer's um, enough moment, um, his turning point. Uh, he did not want to advance any further with his troops. Um, and here he is in Mirapol in September, 1941. Um, uh, this was part of his family's private collection. I ended up identifying, contacting his, his son and his daughter, Lubomir Jr. and his daughter, Yana. Um, and they shared this with me. This was taken in a photo studio in Mirapol. Um, these are his, he's in the middle, the photographers um, sitting in the middle with those glasses. Uh, and he started to write letters back to his wife. Uh, he was just recently married to a Czech woman, um, explaining that the horrors that he was witnessing were overwhelming, that his mind was, his brain was kind of turning black and his hair was turning gray. Um, and they started to together uh, uh, secretly, um, she sent him film. He, he secretly sent back the, 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 um, uh, the negatives. She had them developed. Um, he was warning her, be careful. They're very dangerous where you get them developed. Um, and he ended up faking his, an illness so that he could go home. He went home for the Christmas leave and then he, um, uh, pretended to be, um, sick and could not return and was able to, um, avoid that and ended up in an asylum um, and kind of played out this whole illness with his wife who visited him. Uh, then he was able to go home and he shared those photographs um, with the Jews in his town in Banska Bystrica as a warning that when they are called up for these kinds of deportations to the East that they should avoid it because this was, these, this is what awaited them um, in places like Ukraine. He hid a Jewish family, uh, at least one Jewish family in his attic uh, who happened to also be a OBGYN and delivered his son Lubomir Jr. into the world in 1943. Um, so Lubomir was a um, fully uh, uh, active resistance fighter. He uh, was a technician and provided radio equipment and he was a courier, he had a car and he, had, he was driving materials to the forest, bringing Jews to the forest. Not all of them survived, unfortunately, sadly, when the Nazis, Germans occupied and came in and another Einsatzgruppe went through the region and the forests of Slovakia in August 44 and um, um, killed many of the Jews in the forest. Um, but this was how he, this was his turning point, this image. And that to me was something that I didn't expect. When you see an image like that, you might assume uh, that whoever took such an image at such so closely who was part of that scene um, was a collaborator for that Jewish family who was forced to march to the edge of that pit, who was forced to see friends and family members murdered in broad daylight in that humiliating way. The Ukrainian militia knew um, those, those were the, their, their Jewish neighbors. The Slovakian photographer testified that they were calling them out by name. And so for those Jews who are in the center of that photograph to die that horrible way. Um, the photographer, the man standing there with the camera, our Slovakian resistance fighter, of course, they, they would not know that if they were even able to um, absorb that there was someone there with a, with a camera. The camera, this was part of one of the most documented wars visually and one of the most documented genocides visually, as much as the Nazis tried to suppress the circulation of these atrocity images because they knew they were going to foment resistance and used it in the resistance as they were by our Slovakian photographer. We're at the same time promoting this as the war of all wars, a triumph, the beginning of the 
um, uh, the beginning of the end of, of so-called Judeo-Bolshevism and um, of a German controlled Europe. And so the irony here is that we have, you know, uh, the Leica camera, German pocket camera patented in the 20s, hits the mark in the 30s. This is why our photographer has this handheld camera. Goebbels, the master of propaganda, is embedding journalists, uh, photojournalists, and the war produced something like 3.5 million images. Um, and this is why we have um, some of them um, that show the, 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 the Holocaust, this other so-called what the Nazis said, kind of the war against the Jews behind the lines. And a lot of survivors, um, and a part of my research was to look at how survivors deal with these images. And one way of doing that was to go through, to not only talk to survivors and interact with them with these images and interview them, um, but also to look at the um, tens of thousands. I mean, the, the Visual History Archive is the Spielberg Archive in Southern California, something like 50,000 testimonies, and start to realize that really the vast majority of them, um, survivors hold up images from the war and many of them atrocity images, some of them repeated, you know, copied ones, um, similar hanging images and images we've looked at, not the one that I'm focusing on that was in, locked in an archive. Um, and say, look at this, this is what happened to us. Um, and it raised a lot of questions in my mind about um, the, presence of these photographs and the display of them and um, what it means for survivors who went through this and not to assume uh, that we can speak for them as far as what they want or they don't want. Um, but if we avoid them entirely, if that is the history of what they experienced, uh, the horror they experienced, do we turn away from that? Do we stop studying it. If it's the only trace of that community, do we push it away uh, when it's all that's left of that community and it can open, open up um, all, this, all this history? This is a German advertisement promoting photos as the bridge between the home front um, and the war. Um, this was, by the way, the optical panzer. So these are the, this is promoting the actual cameras that can withstand shrapnel and, and um, warfare. And so our setting uh, for this photograph, um, this is important to look at where these events happen in these images um, and to understand what happens to those communities and the Jews who are murdered and the Ukrainians who remained. And interestingly enough, Miropol, uh, which I, the first time I drove through the region, I drove right past it, little town, but in the 17th century, it was right on this map of Jewish life uh, as a Jewish settlement. So it was, well known within the Jewish community. Um, and if you fast forward to the 20th century in the early part of the 20th century, it was the setting for a very famous Yiddish play by Ansky, an ethnographer who went in to try to capture the vanishing shtetl like um, uh, Vishniak. And, but he was collecting stories um, and Ansky wrote this, this play, um, the Dubek, which is often um, staged around the world to, to this day and was made into a feature film in the 1930s. Um, and I drew a lot from that, um, that story of what Jewish life was like um, up until this point. And this is what we have today when I was in Miropol. And as a reminder, uh, this is the marketplace, reminder of what happens when we lose entire civilizations, entire communities to genocide this is also um, indicative of the failure of the Soviet experiment and the hyperinflation in the 1990s and the fact that Ukraine is, is still at war, um, uh, currently at war uh, on its Eastern territories in Crimea. Um, and really has been a country that has um, gone through a lot in the last century and a half, including the, um, the Holodomor in the 1930s. So this is the old marketplace which when we look at photographs and postcards from the turn of the century, 19th century, it was just a bustling um, uh, place of interaction of, of Ukrainian peasants and the Polish manor was up on the hill. Um, the Jewish marketplace, if you will, there are a lot of the homes here. Now we have empty vacant lots. This is where the Jews were gathered um, before they were shot uh, in the image that we were studying on the 13th. So on the 12th of October were driven from their homes a pogrom ensued 
um, and they were uh, left here through the night and uh, humiliated and um, tortured and, and exhausted and then brought in that state, uh, weakened state, uh, marched to the edge of town to that massacre site. Uh, this is a monument to um, the Second World War here that does not mention um, the Jewish community or the Holocaust. This is a Soviet monument. And they were forced to march down in this direction. The monument's over here. This is the old marketplace down against the direction of this man on his bicycle, um, past this um, kind of prison, this police station. Some were forced to remain here. This was surrounded by Ukrainian police uh, who were uh, armed and singing um, the um, death march uh, and drinking and um, also um, chasing Jewish women and uh, forcing them, um, raping them um, before they were killed. And this is the Soviet investigative report. The arrow there shows us that path. So there's the marketplace I showed you from my photograph and here they're being marched uh, several, a few hundred Jews uh, down in this direction to this park here. So what happened to the killers in the photograph? What happened to the people in the photograph? And you know, an event like this, there are very interesting studies by Levinas and others about um, traumatic events um, like the one in the image and how this, for those who survive it and even the descendants of those who don't, this tra these trajectories, um, biographical and even across generations um, of how these events um, shape lives and, and afterlives. These are the uh, picture mugshot of the Ukrainian killers. So the story of justice here is also part of the book. I, each chapter kind of cuts out elements of the photograph, but then also tries to help us, you know, I pursue the, the, uh, the killers and I um, search for the missing missing. I told you about the photograph uh, photographer. These Ukrainian killers were actually identified um, late um, in the life of the Soviet Union in the late 80s during perestroika, during Glasnost. There was a, another push for, there was no statute of limitations to try to find these Ukrainian collaborators and former policemen. And this gentleman here is exactly the same man we saw um, grimacing in the photo doing the shooting. And here he's fingerprinted and arrested in 1986. And during the investigation, forced to reenact what happened in detail. And that's why we have this very nice um, drawing of what happened by the um, prosecutor in Ukraine, in Zhitomyr. Um, and it went to trial. And there were actually three killers. Um, uh, only one survivor, Jewish survivor that we know of, who was also involved in the trial. Um, and two of the killers were uh, executed by firing squad in January 87. This is incredible that Ukraine got its independence in 1991. And my first trip there was 1992. Um, and um, the third killer was a youth at the time in 1941. He was only 17 years old. And so he got 15 years. And I don't know what happened to him. He went into the prison system and um, was let, you know, never heard from again. So um, that was how that was the outcome of that story. But the photograph is sitting in a Prague um, archive because it had been confiscated. It was part of the interrogation of the photographer. So the pursuit of justice in Soviet Ukraine was um, succeeded as far as identifying these killers and going to court, going to trial and getting convictions, but they don't have this photograph. Um, and yet it, they really reconstruct it in a way that matches the photograph, which is really um, impressive. On the West German side, um, we have um, a story that you probably could predict the outcome, which was a very perfunctory approach of attempt at justice. Um, again, they, the West Germans did not have the photograph. And it just turned out that one of the killers, um, uh, the German unit, um, one of the comrades of, of one of the killers in that unit, um, did not, you know, denounced him years later, this is 1969, um, Kurt Hoffman, he was retired. I don't know if it was con his conscience that got the, overwhelmed him at his, in his later years, what motivated him or if he had a personal vendetta, but he walked into a police station um, at night, <laughs> in an evening, a, 
in January 1969 and in a small town near Hanover and that local policeman at the desk pulled out his form and put it in the typewriter and typed it up. And one and 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 here's this man reporting a crime from the Nazi period. It says from 1941 was the time of the crime, and the victims were Jewish and Russian persons whom he did not know. And then identifies the two killers down to the right, Kuska and Voigt, as having um, gone to that park and shot them and bragged about it afterwards. Came back to their barracks and was reenacting how they doled out these um, shots. Um, and then the man who denounced him here, he went to the scene, the, the actual uh, mass grave um, and verified uh, what had happened. And that's part of his testimony. It turns out that the search for the uh, victims was the most challenging. Um, and we're gonna wrap up soon here so I can answer your questions. Um, what could one do? I, all I had was that image hard to determine the age, I mean, I know names, uh, age of the woman, um, but that child, you, you know, was kind of a toddler. He had, was standing, she was holding his hand. He, you know, probably, you know, walked to that site. So born, if it was in 41, maybe sometime after 35. Um, so I just worked on these lists um, that the Soviets had drawn up um, and whatever I could get my hands on and looked at surnames, family names, family cluster units and birth dates to try to identify the family. Um, I only had about half of the name. So it was um, pretty um, uh, kind of crazy pursuit, but that's what else can you do, right? You just, you just keep, keep looking and hoping um, and work with what you've got. And this was uh, all at Yad Vashem and the staff there was incredibly helpful. Uh, helping me create kind of genealogical charts. And it was really powerful being in the archives as a scholar, <clears throat> creating these trees, these family trees and realizing that that act of recreating that was an act of memorialization in a way and how our, these worlds overlap in the archives and, and in this um, trying to reconstruct this history and trying to restore the names uh, of these families. And I spent a lot of time in my book talking about the importance of family. And we talk about 6 million and we talk about individual names on Yom HaShoah and how much the family was part of the experience of the Holocaust, terror, the worst part of it and as far as suffering to see your family members suffer and die, but also for the Nazis and the collaborators, how much um, they were driven by, um, by family choices or in the case of the genocide heirs, Hitler himself, who said in 41, not one Jewish family should be allowed to remain in the continent of Europe. They will come back, the, the offspring will come back and avenge. Um, and so they were obsessed with destroying the family unit as well. And in this one page of testimony, I got to the V, A to, a to Z, um, a, a survivor testified that her family, her cousins had been shot her, uh, in the Miracle Park in 1941. And this photograph was attached to the testimony, which was really rare uh, to have a photograph from the war. This was taken in 1941, taken in Mirapol. This family was killed in the park on that day. And look at this little boy. I mean, just this is how this family wanted to be remembered, what was left of it, the women and children, and how this woman just, this was the, these were the three in the image who were killed together. Um, and it just, reminded me of the image that we've been looking at because the woman who's bending over actually has another child on her lap and is holding the hand of a little boy. But I could not be certain. And I, I showed it to Ukrainian witnesses who recognize this Jewish family from Mirapol as they knew them as classmates, as former friends, um, but could not um, actually make the match from the crime scene photograph. These are other Ukrainian witnesses we spoke to the help us piece together the story. I went in there with Father Debois' team and um, we worked together. I wanted to see how they conduct their research, the Yahad and Unum organization. And we went to the actual crime scene itself um, based on the maps. And um, this got us back into the, or me back into the environmental history and what this history does to the topography of these locations. Um, and in fact, the hills were so, there was so much distortion and um, the haloing effect, the mounds that were, the vegetation was different. It just, 
the whole landscape, you, you immediately realize that this was not a natural, this was not natural erosion. Um, and uh, reach down and actually just moving the soil and the leaves uh, discover the bones of the victims that were so close to the surface, vertebrae and um, skull fragments. And this didn't you know, make sense given it was um, uh, so many years later, but we realized that the Soviet investigation I told you that was so late in 86, 87, they carried out this um, very aggressive exhumation with bulldozers. And this is why the landscape looks like this. This was the kind of operation they brought in there, which was yet another assault on the victim's remains, on their, um, on their souls in this resting place. Um, so that was also um, rather disturbing. And um, we reported it and I can tell you in the Q&A what happened there. So I'd like to just wrap up now with the shoes um, because of the fact that a lot of the history could not be recovered as far as the victims and the limits of what we can find, especially in the history of, of genocide when the intent of the genocide heirs to destroy without a trace is, is so, um, in this case with the Nazis, especially thorough but, thorough, but also with other genocide heirs. If you look at what happened in Srebrenica, the Serbs, deliberately dismembered all their victims as much as they could and strewn and separated all their body parts in various locations so that people couldn't identify them. That was part of the plan, part of the erasure. The empty shoes and the crumpled coat exist there as questions, as gaps in knowledge. They remind us of the victims whom we cannot see, the many who were murdered and remained missing. Prior to and during the Holocaust, empty shoes figured in abstract art, literature, and photography as symbols of humanity. And the use of shoes to depict loss is not only a post-war curatorial technique of Holocaust museums. As Holocaust sources of material culture, shoes have come to aestheticize absence and mourning on a large scale. These stanzas from the Yiddish poet Abraham Sutzkaber, which I'm going to read, his poem, A Load of Shoes, were written in 1943 upon the discovery of his deported mother's shoes in the Vilna ghetto in Lithuania. And now I just want to, just a few stanzas from Sutzkaver. The feet from these boots with buttons outside, or these with no body, or these with no bride. Where is the child who fit in these? Is the maiden barefoot who bought these? Slippers and pumps. Look, there are my mother's, her Sabbath pair in with the others. In Sutzkaver's poem, empty boots, slippers, and pumps exist somewhere between the living and the dead, among the children, maidens, and brides at a wedding or observing a Sabbath. His shoes dance and patter. They stimulate our ability to imagine the past and provide poetic testimony to the lives of the wearers. Unlike those haunting but inert objects, we see um, enshrined behind glass in Birkenau or bronzed as uh, a memorial alongside the Danube River in Budapest. One photograph too can pass across time and space from its creator to family members, prosecutors, curators, historians, and the viewing public. A photograph can put things in motion and elicit from those who study the image or are questioned about it an avalanche of information and emotion. But like flawed testimonies and memories, photographs can mislead because they can never completely capture the reality of the event pictured or those involved. The Jewish man who was murdered, perhaps with his family, is not there, although his empty shoes and crumpled coat remain. We cannot see beyond the frame of the images. We cannot see 300, just turn 360 degrees to take in the entire setting of the victims waiting to be killed or other possible onlookers, including our Slovakian photographer and his comrades and more German officials. The papers strewn amid the bullet casings at the edge of the mass grave could be German lists or Jewish identity documents. Atrocity images, especially the rare ones that attest to the acts of genocide, the crime of all crimes, offend and shame us. When we turn away from them, we promote ignorance. When we display them in museums without captions and download them from the internet with no historical context, we denigrate the victims. And when we stop researching them, we cease to care about historical justice, the threat of genocide and the murdered missing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, that was a really fascinating uh, talk. Uh, the book is fascinating. 
um, people can order it. Um, there's a link on the Millim uh, website. And thank you for showing us so much that's actually not in the book. Um, quite a lot of your images uh, that, you, that, that we saw tonight are, are not in the book. So good to see. So if you have questions for Wendy, uh, get them in the Q&A now and uh, we will endeavour to uh, go through them in the next uh, the next few minutes. Um, I, I wonder, Wendy, what was the point in your research when you realised that there was actually a book to write mm. uh, about this photograph? Was it something that hit you immediately or did it take some time to realize there was there was quite a lot to say? That's such a great question. Um, for a long time, I didn't know if I had enough material. I mean, I, 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 I was determined to find out as much as I could, um, kind of crossing my fingers and just digging and, and contacting colleagues and showing the image to my colleagues and participating in workshops. I mean, I really involved a lot of people in this, including at the museum. And I don't think I could have done it without my colleagues and without the resources of Yad Vashem and the museum in Washington. Um, so uh, I, I, I wanna share credit if there's any credit there. But um, I have to say when I figured out the photographer's story and found his family uh, with, with my colleagues and, and they were so generous in sharing their personal um, archive with me. Um, I felt like, okay, this is this. There's there's something here. I've got to get this story out. Um, also, as I started to find out more from the Soviet side of their their case, and that was thousands and thousands and thousands of pages that investigation. I knew I had something there. I part of me was um, kind of despair uh, in despair about it because I couldn't find the victims. And once I realized that the killers could not be brought to justice, uh, or as I realized that, and I really thought for me, the big challenge was, you know, for me, a test of my success or in some ways was to find those victims and to um, just, because that's not how they wanted to be photographed um, and, and to restore that history. Um, and that still is that, I still live with that ambivalence, that frustration, but um, so that was kind of keeping me from thinking I had a book for a long time when I, when I couldn't, when couldn't pin down their names and identify them 100%. I, I feel like I got close, but, um, but I found other stories uh, in the book about Jewish life there and of other Jewish families and collected more testimonies from um, uh, witnesses. Um, so um, yeah, that was, it was enough, enough for the book. Um, also, I, wanted to write uh, a book. I knew it wasn't going to be a lengthy book, a kind of tome um, and, a, and a deep history of that community um, and, a, and a deep kind of academic study um, that I was going to take uh, trying to distill the story down so that um, and uh, leave a lot in the footnotes as far as all the substance there and the archival foundation. Um, because I was hoping that people, since the photograph is so disturbing, that they could sit down and maybe one or two sit, you know, and read it like in one or two sittings um, uh, and, and maybe not live with that photograph for that long, but just kind of have that experience in that way. So I knew it was not going to be a lengthy book. I think it, um, it brings into play a lot of things that people might not know. And certainly the first time somebody shows you a Holocaust photograph and then explains it in forensic terms, uh, it, it, it brings to life a lot of things that uh, perhaps one wouldn't have, have thought of. So um, it, it teaches us there's, there's a great depth of, uh, of richness, richness in, the, in photography and a huge amount of information. Uh, also, um, it, it's almost a story that was, that was wanting to be told, do you, do you not think? It reminds me a bit of, uh, we, we had Daniel Lee on a few weeks, uh, Daniel Lee talking about the uh, SS officers uh, armchair again uh, a discovery of some objects which lead to a story being told that hadn't been told before and I think this is happening more and more it's, it's mm -hmm. we're uncovering things that, that that were waiting to be to be heard and waiting to be to be told. Mm -hmm. um, J Jay Prosser who is one of our local academics uh, he says this is so compelling what a dedication to pursue this image in all of its details if it's not too personal to ask what was the effect of this pursuit and writing on you? Hmm. Yeah, this is definitely one of the harder, more, well, I have to say that the, 
every, all the books, all the research on the Holocaust is difficult. Um, and I, after each book, I wonder whether or not I'm going to write another one. And then something comes to my attention and um, it's, it's not a field you can uh, walk away from in that way. Um, uh, especially coming from a place of privilege as I do, I don't have a direct connection to this. I, I can, um, you know, I don't, my family history isn't, um, I'm not Jewish. Uh, my German background goes back to the 19th century. Uh, I have no connection to Ukraine um, in terms of my family background or anything. Um, so I can do this from a distance, um, but there's nothing about it that is remains distant. I mean, it, it just, it's there <laughs> when I go back to these sites and I uncover the bones and yes, it's, it's definitely, I carry it, it with me. Um, but I, feel like I, I just, I have the privilege to be able to do this in the support of the community. So, um, so I can, I can close my laptop, um, and, and rejoin my family and, and this beautiful setting them in here in Yosemite, for instance. Um, but yes, no, it definitely, um, it stays with you, but it, it also is a driver, you know, you, you get into this material, you become outraged, you become, even when I said I was frustrated, I couldn't find the victims. It's like, it also just like keeps pushing you to, to want to discover more and, and realize that, you know, the, that child didn't have a life, that child in that photograph didn't grow up and, and realize himself and whatever that might've been. And my children did. And, you know, how do you, what is justice? Uh, what does it look like? What does memorialization look like? It's putting, you know, working in the archives, it's um, identifying those killers in the photograph, you know, um, and, and other intellectual drivers as well about, trying to um, with students you know as a as a teacher um just reaffirm the importance of the factual basis of this history and the archival basis of it and and that it happened um that you know uh i'm still talking to survivors and and you know we live in a world now where people question this and think you know have all kinds of outlandish theories and and um you know we've we've got to be really strong as far as just continually to um, be firm about uh, these events and, um, and, you know, until we can, uh, because we can see already that uh, this kind of um, thinking um, and these kinds of regimes and movements, um, they can reappear within, you know, um, not even when a generation is removed. Uh, so, you know, it's really, really important. We can't just say you have to be vigilant about democracy or never forget. I think we realize that um, very much today. Uh, Anna Michael Crook uh, asks, um, how can we ensure that others do not use historic photographs to promote their own agendas? I suppose very relevant to, uh, to what you've just said. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the doctoring of photographs, airbrushing, manipulation, false captioning, false placement. I mean, this is just um, part of the challenge of of the use and manipulation of evidence, both in, in all forms, especially photographs, because people, you know, it is kind of incontrovertible evidence and is so powerful that it, it can be um, easily distorted. And we know about airbrushing and all these techniques. As soon as the photograph came into existence, it's been, it's been cropped and manipulated for various propaganda purposes. Um, so that's a reality. Um, but we, you know, the point is, you don't kind of just let that uh, exist in, in its in its own way. You you have to provide an alternative as far as this is um, uh, this is the training. These these are the methods um, that we use um, to demonstrate that this is you know an actual photograph. Here we have one. Here we have a version that is cropped. Here we can see you know these are the names of these people. This is what you know to really um, establish the the empirical reality of it. Um, and not to indulge too much um, on the aesthetic side to the point of kind of obfuscation and, and, and maybe even um, uh, opening up the door to uh, questioning whether or not the event in the picture actually happened. Um, so this is, you know, this is just part of the ethical um, uh, responsibility. Journalists are trained in this way. And, um, you know, and that's part of my argument that uh, allowing these images to circulate without calling them out or insisting on captions or insisting on the accuracy of those captions, you know, is, is, is part of that slippery slope. Uh, letting these things, you know, without 
objecting to them, like that image of the Jewish man being shot, the last Jew in Vinitsa, you know, um, was picked up by a commercial outfit. Uh, um, I can't remember if it was in Egypt or, or where it was, but was put on coffee mugs and t-shirts and, and used um, to um, uh, humiliate um, those, the, the victims of the Holocaust and to um, make a mockery of that, of that man. And, and so um, this is when you speak up because um, that moment when you speak up, that moment when you reestablish what's right and stand firm about it and have that backup, that basis for it, um, you're essentially reaffirming and reestablishing our, our boundary lines, our, how we want to be, how we want to exist culturally in this world of cultural wars, your enough moment, your limits. Uh, it's not a free for all. Um, <laughs> I mean, so it's unfortunately we have to keep, uh, keep doing that um, because of the, the, the age of mass reproduction that we live in of, of the internet and, and uh, the fact that pretty much anyone can write anything or blog anything or assert anything. Um, and, and often people are not um, checked. They're not, you know, they're Very not true. Checked. We have the same question from John Cowell and Ann Bennett. They're interested why the Soviets uh, started to uh, investigate these murders in the 1980s. Was there some ulterior political motive? Yeah, no, it's a combination of forces, fascinating um, confluence of both the Gorbachev era of things loosening up, which provided an opening to talk about the uniqueness of the Holocaust, that these were not all peaceful Soviet citizens, that something else was going on during the Great Patriotic War, right? So there was that possibility for Jews to go back to Ukraine um, and interact with the mayor in Mirabal and talk about memorialization and where are where is our family history? So those kind of fissures opening up in the, the wall. Um, then you have also the lack of statute of limitations and this on the 50th anniversary, or sorry, the 40th anniversary in, in um, 85, each that would renew kind of the effort. Um, there were documentary films made at this time, calls for extradition. They were saying this is our last chance um, and more cooperation between the, the West and the, and the Soviet Union on extradition um, and justice issues. There, were, there had been longstanding accusations on the part of the Soviets that we were harboring all these war criminals in Canada and UK and the US and people like Demyanyuk, right? Who was this uh, guard? Um, uh, Trevniki guard at, at Sobibor and Treblinka. Um, so these were cases, Fedorenko case um, that were coming up in the late eighties um, that were part of the um, kind of renewed pursuit. So, yeah. And this, this prosecutor Makarevich, he was Jewish um, and he was a um, kind of a young, you know, new generation um, and he was going to make his mark and he just went across his various districts and started to really pin down who still left and was very determined. Very interesting. And uh, just to conclude, do you think the do you think this story is told or do you think there's more to come? I mean, do you think we might find the negatives one day and what what might that add that hasn't been known already? Oh, I do hope we find them. There are dozens of negatives, not just the ones from that day, but from other, uh, as he was moving uh, eastward, I, I have some prints that, that survive, so I can see he, he actually documented a pogrom in Zloshev, um, and some books have been written about that, so we, that would be great to kind of corroborate that or open up another, identify other victims um, if possible. Um, but yes, all of these images um, are bringing to light a lot of different aspects of this history is that we don't know all there is to know. Um, and for instance, a photo album just emerged from under the sink of the deputy commandant of Sobibor that was recently published. And um, in that photograph, we see Demyanyuk, the Ukrainian guard at Sobibor carousing with his German, uh, uh, the German officials, they went on a little field trip together, a so-called Ausflug to Berlin. And, you know, and, you know, this was not the uh, rendition that was presented in the courtroom. You know, there were, there, you know, well, we weren't with them at all. Um, and so that whole idea of collaboration in the way that we see in the photograph today, uh, there were, 
you know, relationships there that were not uh, as distant uh, as one uh, might have assumed or was purported in the post-war testimony. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. And thank you so much for being our guest this evening. Uh, Wendy's book, The Ravine, uh, is available. Uh, if you go onto our website and click the link, uh, it won't cost you any more. And Millen will benefit from a few coppers for each copy. It's highly recommended. And as a little thank you, I'm going to send you some of my own photography. Um, okay. uh, I don't think there's any need to be forensic with it, but this is mm -hmm. uh, Mag and David Adom, the ambulance service uh, in Israel uh, in action uh, just a few years ago. So hopefully you'll, uh, you'll enjoy that. We'll get that posted out to you. Now, let me tell you about some of our up and coming events uh, in August. Next Monday, we have the Pulitzer Prize winning reporter and author Jonathan Kaufman. Uh, he'll be talking about his recently published book, Kings of Shanghai, the rival Jewish dynasties that helped create modern China. The following week on the 9th of August, we join forces with the Jewish Historical Society of England for a talk by Anna Kirshen about the Jewish tailors trade unions in Leeds. And then on the 16th of August, Tony Zendel is our guest. He uh, is giving his postponed talk uh, Kosher Foxtrot, uh, talking about his book uh, about Jewish connections to the golden age of dance music, dance bands. And then finally, for now, on the 23rd of August, Mariel Schindler will be telling us about her book, The Lost Café Schindler, a family memoir centred on one of Innsbruck's most famous institutions. Our programme continues into September and beyond. Please do visit milim.org.uk and sign up there for our regular bulletins. All of our events are free, but you can make a small donation on the website and that will help to support our work and the cost of providing these webinars. It remains for me to thank our guest, Wendy Lauer. Once again, thank you so much, Wendy. Yeah. Uh, thank and you. We're looking forward to seeing you all at a future event. And until then, stay safe. See you soon.